Let's continue in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, please. The second chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. <clears throat> now remember, just to recap, as we go through Hebrew, Hebrews, we need to be mindful of several things presuppositionally before we approach any text or section of the epistle, even though we do it chronologically and in order as it is written. First of all, it was written to believing Jews. That does not mean its content does not apply to everyone. It certainly does. But to understand how its content applies, we need to understand how it applied and what it meant to the people it was written to. Secondly, the Sitzim Leben, the cultural and historical setting and situation. It was written before the fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus and Daniel chapter 9 concerning the temple's destruction. There were Jewish believers in Israel, and especially in Jerusalem, this was focused on Jerusalem, <clears throat> during a time of growing persecution in the Roman world, in the pagan world, but also what had been an intermittent and at times ceaseless persecution and opposition from the Sanhedrin. The numbers of Jews coming to faith was steady, but so was the opposition. But problems set into the church, a number of problems set into the church. And one of them was with the imminent threat of persecution. Some believers were trying to argue that you can go back under the law of Moses and trust in the Levitical sacrificial system. They needed to re be reminded that the blood of those animals were only types of what the Messiah would do the blood of animals can never take away sin. And this was fundamental to the teaching of, of the epistle. There are other passages in the New Testament, and even some in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, that speak to the same issue. Only the blood of the Messiah could take away sin. As you know, we had a big upheaval when we had to get rid of someone from Moriel, who taught God the Father is not the Creator, who taught that you could pray God's power into a tie or jacket and knock people over for healing. We didn't know he believed that. He claimed to have renounced it, but he was still teaching it. And then the third thing was, in addition to, to the heresy of saying the Father is not the creator, he was arguing that the blood of animals can take away sin and will do so in the millennium, which is absolute nonsense. There will be blood sacrifices in the millennial reign of Christ but they will not take away sin. They will be a memorial of what the Messiah did. There'll be a way to preach the gospel to people in the millennium because Satan will be bound. There will not be the same consciousness of sin or the same temptation we have now, and people will not have the same capacity to understand sin. Hence, as the Old Testament sacrifices were a way to teach about what the Messiah would do, in the millennium, the sacrifices will be a way to teach what he did do. And, of course, we had to get rid of this person from our ministry in South Africa. He had been an Orthodox Jew, but he was unfortunately supported and promoted and defended by Studio Scotland, by the Menlaws and these things, the people who made the Daniel, the Daniel Project. Um, and that became a scandal, ugly scandal in itself. There were two discs that I agreed to do. One was a documentary, and the second was evangelistic, in which I presented the gospel. Well, they took the gospel disc out and merchandised the first one on its own and sold it to Hollywood, to a subsidiary of Paramount Pictures. And it was all commercial. It was very ugly. And then they were promoting heresy. And it led to a big, ugly fight and all kinds of attacks on us and lies against myself and so forth. It was just a scam, and, a, and, and, and it was the promulgation and defense of heresy. But it's interesting that it, in part, came back to this in Hebrews, this idea of the blood, of the blood. And there was a film clip of, of the Menlaws and Stuart Menlaws saying, he heard nothing, nothing heretical. Well, how about God the Father is not the creator, and how about that the blood of animals can take away sin? That is heretical. Therefore, Stuart Menelaus is also a heretic because he defends 
what is heretical, and even promoted it. And this caused a big split in the scandal. It was a very ugly time. We don't comment on it anymore. We don't engage when they attack us. I only mention it because of its relevance to what we're studying now in Hebrews. The blood of these animals could not take away sin. And under this threat of persecution, the people were gravitating, or some people were gravitating and being told they could go back under the Levitical sacrificial system. They needed to be reminded that the temple was indeed going to be destroyed as Daniel predicted and as Jesus reiterated. <clears throat> they needed to be reminded. So there were three aspects of, of Hebrews. The first aspect, as we said, was the eschatological. What does the last days really mean? The last days having three different meanings from eschatos. One, it's the latter days, the age of the church and of the new covenant, as opposed to the age of the law, former and latter. In Hebrews 1, in these last days, he was not speaking of the imminent return of Christ or events surrounding his parousia immediately. They were speaking of the age of the church as compared to the old covenant. In the old covenant, God spoke to us through the fathers, through the avot, in many portions and in many ways, referring to the Pentecost Shavuah, and in many ways referring to the literary genre of the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, Torah, Nevim, Katuvim. I refer you back to last week's teaching. I'm simply going through it in order to review what we did for the sake of those who may just be watching it for the first time. So you'd really have to go back to the first one. We explained these things in depth, <clears throat> what last days means. Last days also means, of course, the close of the age. Okay, the close of the age. That is indeed the events leading up to, surrounding, and following the return of Christ. This, of course, is the Suna Telesius uh, of the uh, uh, Tau Aeones, uh, the, the close of the present age. Now, that meant this age, this world, before Christ comes. The third was the age of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles, which would be completed. The times of the Gentiles in which the age of the church took place. Now, the events surrounding 70 AD, the events of 70 AD decisively marked the close of the age of God's dealing with Israel in totality. And the age of the church was all that existed after that in God's economy. God was no longer dealing with Jews under the law. The temple would not be standing. He gave one generation a chance to accept Yeshua before the temple was destroyed. So it's that interim period, the end of that age, the age of Levitical worship, as opposed to the age of the church, which overlaps with the times of the Gentiles. Now, the times of the Gentiles do come to a close at the end of the present world, when God again turns his purposes back to the salvation of Israel and the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble and uh, with the advent of Antichrist and so on. However, we need to realize the last days has those three meanings. And the events predicted by Daniel, by Jesus, and then predicted here in Hebrews, which we will eventually get to in chapter 9, foreshadow what's going to happen at the close of the age, at the uh, parousia, the return of Christ and what leads up to it, okay? Um, Suna Telesis Tau Aeones. Well, so we look at the eschatology. Second, we look at the Christology, the eternal deity of Jesus or of Christ as the Son of God. He was always the Son of God. He became the Anointed One, but he was always the Son of God. We need to be careful of the ancient heresies of adoptionism, that he became God's Son at his baptism, 
No, he did not. He was always the son of God. He was eternally existent. He was sent to be the Messiah, and he became the Messiah. But he was always God. He was always God's son, and the world was made through him. Okay. Uh, the baptism of John was significant in his messiahship. John represented the law and righteousness under the law. None born among women was greater than John. However, John's righteousness was under the law. That's why John said, he who was least in the kingdom, or the scriptures say, he who was least in the kingdom is greater than John. John had the most righteousness you could have under the Torah, under the law. But believers who are born again have the imputed righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is superior to the righteousness under the law. Now, of course, John has come into that fullness and into that salvation. It was speaking about what John was at that time when he was alive, the epitome of righteousness under the law. But the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to us is superior to the righteousness under the law. Jesus, however, did not become the son then. This is my son in whom I will please. Jesus did not become the son at his baptism. He became the Messiah on earth, but he was, which he was sent to do and foreordained to do, but he was always the, the divine son of God. And although the incarnation was in some way unique, it did not absolutely set a precedent. We have Christophanes, where you have enfleshments of Christ in the Old Testament, one of which is Melchizedek, Melchizedek, who appears in the epistle to the Hebrews, and we'll be looking at that when we get to it. So we're looking at Hebrews from the point of view of eschatology, from Christology. And again, much, much of the text is spent quoting Old Testament passages proving that Jesus is not an angel, a mere angel, that he's superior to the angels. Again, this flies straight in the face of the lies of the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, and those who confuse Jesus with Michael the archangel. Third, the third is typology, how these Old Testament sacrifices on the Levitical system were pictures of Christ. So it was those th things. Now, that is what we looked at in a nutshell last week in more depth. If you're just joining us, please listen to last week's recording. But now we're in chapter 2, verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer, not closer, but there's an urgency, much closer, attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. This word uh, in Greek is an interesting word. Parareo. Parareo. And it means to float away as if carried by currents. It could also be a Greek word to slip to slip. While you're not paying attention to something, it slips away. But the primary meaning is to drift by floating due to currents. That is what it means. So before it goes any further, it begins by issuing a caveat, an admonishment, and an exhortation. Not just to pay attention, attention to what we have heard that is the gospel lest we drift away from it it is possible to drift away not just fall away but fall away progressively drift away slip away without realizing it until you've gone too far now we did a teaching on this some time ago still available in audio on the Moria website, called Those Who Drift. Those Who Drift. If you have not heard it, it's still available. Those Who Drift. But let's understand this. This particular verse, 1 of chapter 2, prepares for 
things that occur later in the epistle, in chapter 6 and in chapter 10. Again, there's no chapter divisions in the original canon, but in chapter 6 and in chapter 10, where it deals about those who fall away. Hebrews teaches against an unconditional once saved, always saved. Do I believe in once saved, always saved? Yes, as the scripture teaches it. Do I believe in eternal security? Yes, as the scriptures teach it. Not as Calvinism and others have distorted it. It is not unconditional. We've explained this many times, and we will be looking at it again when we get to chapters 6 and chapters 10. We are eternally secure in Christ, but an unrepentant backslider is no longer in Christ. They must repent to have the assurance of salvation. Now the Lord, the good shepherd, leaves the 99 for the one. He goes after the backslider. All of those things are true. And we shall address them as we've addressed them many times when we get to chapter 6 and 10. But it is possible to have been in Christ and then not to be. You've got somebody who falls away from the Lord and begins fornicating and living with his unsaved girlfriend or into substance abuse and thinking they're still saved. But without holiness, no man shall see God. Now, of course, there are those, again, of a reformed persuasion usually, who will say, such a person was never saved to begin with. They may be right. They may be right. But it is possible for somebody to have been saved to begin with and no longer have that salvation unless they repent. We will address it again in the future, and we've pointed to it many times. But a classic example of this in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians 5, where you had that Christian in Corinth who was involved in serious sexual immorality with his father's wife, something even the pagans wouldn't do. And Paul gave him over to the destruction of his flesh that his soul might be saved, that he would repent before he died. The Lord does not like to save people in order to lose them. The Lord may bring calamity and judgment, destruction physically, into the life of an unrepentant backslider to get them to repent rather than see them be eternally lost. But if the possibility was not there, certainly the theoretical possibility, but even the practical possibility, if the practical possibility was not there of the guy being eternally lost, Paul would not have had to give him over to Satan to get him to repent, to destroy his flesh. Why would you give somebody over for the destruction of their flesh that their soul might be saved if their salvation was unconditional? Or if they were never saved to begin with? This was a person who was a believer. Do not believe unconditional, once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, yes. The good shepherd leaving the 99 for the one, yes. The Lord bringing calamity and judgment, if necessary, into the life of a backslider to get them to repent, yes. Eternal security, if you're in Christ, you're eternally secure. Yes, 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 yes. But is it unconditional? There'll be an apostasy at the close of the age. Many will fall away. Many are falling away now. Whole denominations have turned their back on Christ and departed from the word of God. Whole denominations. The Southern Baptists in the United States, their former president, J.D. Greer, stood up and called upon Baptists, born-again believers, to be the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights. That's the mission of the Baptists, of born-again Christians? This is depravity. That's the Southern Baptist in America. The mainstream Protestant denominations are worse, far worse. 
we live in an age of apostasy. Can anybody in their right mind think that people who would do that are saved? Or that a, a preacher who would perform a same-sex marriage, even though he professes to be born again, is going to heaven unless he repents? This is a lie of the devil. However, most Christians don't realize those things don't happen automatically. Denominations, churches, ministries, they don't fall away automatically. They drift just like individuals. We drift. We don't realize how far we've drifted. It is amazing. I once heard a preacher speak about when he was fishing in a boat and they were tired and they took a nap in the boat when they were fishing and they woke up and the boat had drifted so far from the shore they couldn't believe how far they drifted. When we don't pay careful attention, we drift. And we drift further than we realize, but because it happens progressively. We're deceived by it. Remember, sin itself has the innate capacity to deceive. The world deceives, the devil deceives, obviously. We deceive ourselves, other people can deceive us. But not least of all, sin has an innate capacity to deceive. Much like slowly boiling water. You heat the water and the frog doesn't know it's being cooked alive. The thermodynamics of what's happening has a power of its own. Sin takes on a personification and a power of its own. Of course, the devil's in back of it. Of course, is the element of the world. Of course, is the element of our old nature and the element of other people who, who could be deceivers. All of that is true. But sin itself has an inherent capacity to trick us. Now, let's look at this. We must pay not just close attention, but much closer attention unless we drift. This chapter begins speaking about two kinds of sin, sins of omission and sins of commission. When we drift, the drifting does not begin with sins of commission. It begins with sins of omission. Once we fail to do the things we ought to do, it becomes inevitable we will do things we ought not. Once we fail to do things we ought to do, it becomes inevitable that we do things that are blatantly and unmistakably wrong. You drift into it. If a believer begins to compromise on their prayer life, on fellowshipping with other Christians, on witnessing and evangelism, and above all, on prayer. If we begin to drift away by not doing the things we should, the essentials of the faith, prayer, fellowship, inclusive of the Lord's Supper, witnessing and evangelism, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, if we don't do the things we should, it is only a matter of time, and usually a short matter of time, before we begin doing the things we ought not. That will be true of an individual. It'll be true of a marriage and a family. It'll be true of a church. It'll be true of a ministry. It'll be true of a denomination. And ultimately, it will be true of the apostate church at large before the Lord comes. For this reason, Paul, for what reason? Because of who Jesus is and what he did. And because he is going to conquer the enemies of God as his footstool. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. But thy kingdom come. In Hebrew, tavo marchutecha. Thy kingdom come. 
our worldview needs to be framed by God's perspective. And in God's perspective, thy kingdom come is absolutely fundamental. This world will come to an end in its present state. Satan will be destroyed. Sin will be obliterated, ultimately annihilated. And the enemies of God will be made as the footstool under Christ. This thinking of the kingdom that's coming must frame our perspective and our worldview. Oh, prophecy, oh, Jesus will come someday. I know that intellectual. No, it's not just something we're aware of intellectually, although we are. It is something that should frame our perspective of this life and this world and affect the way we live as a result. For this reason, we must pay closer attention. He's going to put Satan under his feet. There's a battle. Satan is desperate, Peter tells us. And he's going to become more desperate as we get closer to the parousia. We must pay attention. much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. If we stop thinking about this life and this world in relation to the coming kingdom, we will drift. As I've been warning for more than 25 years, most of the lies and deceptions being perpetrated against the body of Christ and against Christians today by Satan and his agents, wittingly and unwittingly, are designed to get us to hope or trust in this life and in this world. What is on back of the word faith money preaching? Name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, mammon worship, trusting in this life. What is on back of dominionism, kingdom now theology, over-realized eschatology, trusting in this life? You'll see that exposition of the word of God has been replaced by motivational speaking, simply using biblical or Christian jargon. What is that about, motivational speaking? Trusting in this life, even though they pretend it's a sermon. Our entire worldview has to be influenced, even controlled, by the presupposition that is absolutely assured that this thing is coming to an end, that the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. Whether it happens in our lifetime or not is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the Lord comes for us personally or becomes for us corporately. This thing as it is now is Satan's kingdom and it is finished. Don't trust in it. Backsliding always has to do, it was always in some way related to trusting in this life. Backsliding is always related to somehow trusting in this life. And I warn all of us, or I should say, God warns all of us, and I am no exception. Well, let's look. much closer attention. When we fail to do what we should, it is only a matter of time and usually a brief matter of time before we do what we ought not. Now, right in the middle of this, of this Christology, talking about the superiority of Jesus, of Christ, of the Messiah, of the Son of God over the angels, it injects this. It injects this warning, this caveat about drifting. Remember, backsliding does not begin spontaneously. It is a progressive process that begins with drifting, with slipping. We slip, we drift. Now, the Lord will warn us, try to get us back where we belong, but we must pay 
not just close attention, much closer attention. When I see people who don't read the scriptures every day, if they're able to, or when I see people who don't fellowship with other Christians, they just don't see it as important. Oh, I know what I believe that did. No, iron sharpens iron. Thus a man strengthens his friend's friend, confidence. When I see people who will say things like, well, if any non-believer asks me the gospel, I'll tell them what I believe. Is that how you go fishing? Is that how you go fishing? Now, Jesus did take the fish when he rose and put them into the skillet. Sometimes the Lord does give you a fish. If you ask the Father for a fish, he's not going to give you a serpent. Sometimes the Lord gives us a fish. But he told the apostles, go fishing. Now, no, we are not all evangelists. We cannot all fish with a net. We cannot all stand up and preach to a large group of unsaved people and see people coming to faith. Not everybody has the gift of evangelism. Not everybody can fish with a net, as we pointed out many times. But everyone can fish with a rod, with a pole. Every one of us can knock on a door, hand somebody a gospel tract, give our testimony, build a relationship with an unsaved person. We are called to be fishers of men. That was not just the apostles. It's all of us. The wise man delivers souls. Some people are evangelists, but we're all fishermen. Some of us can fish with nets by God's calling and grace, but we can all fish with a pole. This idea that we don't have to, or the Lord will just bring them in. Part of this poison thinking, of course, comes again from the world of Calvinism. They believe in predestination and that the people who are going to go to heaven, the Lord's going to save them no matter what we do. At one time, the mainstream Calvinistic denominations or denominations that were corrupted by Calvinism, such as the Baptists in England, opposed missions and evangelism. They told William Carey, who brought the gospel to India in the tradition of the Apostle Thomas, they told him, if the Lord wants to convert the heathen, he'll do so without your help or mine. It's predestined. The Lord knows who's going to get saved. He's going to make them. No, no, no. The Lord does foreknow who's going to be saved. But you are my witnesses, saith the Lord. We are all called to go fishing. Remember, every unsaved people, that person we know, every unsaved person you know, Relatives, neighbors, workmates, every unsaved person we know is on their way to eternal hell. And we have the message of salvation, the only message of salvation that can keep them from going there. You see somebody on their way to hell and you're waiting for them to ask you, now, we should be witnesses. We should live our lives in a godly manner that they'll be drawn to Christ through our example and things like that. Yes, that they'll question us about what we believe and why we think and live the way we do. Yes. But when you go fishing, you, you're looking to catch the fish. You're not waiting for the fish to jump out of the brook or the sea. When people drift, one of the first things you look for is their attitude towards witnessing and evangelism. Somebody's prayer life, that's between them and the Lord. You might not know anything about their prayer life. You might not know about their scripture reading. You might not know about those things. Um, but there are things you can see visibly displayed. One is fellowshipping with other Christians, and the second, oh, obviously, moral living. But then, are they actively trying to reach unsaved people? 
If you see a lack of evangelism in a church, in a ministry, in a person, they have drifted. And they are drifting. If a church or a ministry stops preaching the gospel, sooner or later, usually sooner than later, they will stop believing it. There are organizations now that can no longer be considered biblically Christian, but they once were. They preach the gospel. We cannot consider World Vision to be a Christian organization by biblical definition, but they were. We can no longer consider Bernardo's to be a Christian organization by biblical definition, but they were. They drifted. They drifted. They became obsessed with purely a social gospel. They looked for social relief. Nobody has ever been saved through a social gospel. Now, this is not to say we should not care for the poor and the sick and the homeless. It's not to say that. We should. But they must be evangelized. The greatest need of any hungry person is the bread of life. The greatest need of any sick person is salvation. And it's irrelevant of circumstances. The greatest need of a wealthy person or a poor person is the same. Salvation. Evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. If somebody is not witnessing, <laughs> the table has four legs. It will not stand well on three, and it will collapse on two. Moral living goes without saying. Fellowship, scripture, prayer, and evangelism. Without those four legs, that table is going to fall over. And a Christian's life and ministry will fall over. When people are first saved, they don't have a lot of knowledge or experience, but they have their first love. And they want to tell other people about Jesus because they met him. That was the fault of the Ephesians. They left their first love. What is the absolute definite diagnosis of a church or a Christian that's left its first love? Do the deeds you did at first. Well, what deeds did you do at first when you were first born again? You wanted to tell everybody. Now, we went about it often in an inappropriate or foolish way because we didn't know any better. We preached at people instead of to them. We didn't know about building relationships and sharing in that kind of a context of a relationship and things like this. We knew a lot of religious cliches or biblical cliches even, but we didn't have a lot of wisdom, biblical knowledge, or experience. We get those things over time with discipleship. But we had our first love. We wanted to go out and tell other people about Jesus. I guarantee if you see evangelism not being prioritized in the life of any person or any church or any ministry, they have drifted and they are drifting and they will wind up spiritually dead they'll just be a religion but they won't be the body of christ well let's look well the words spoken through angels proved unalterable now this speaks of angelic agency in giving the law yeah. and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty in Greek, you have two words, hamartino and hamarteno, for sin. But here they are explained in the Greek language. Now remember, it's being written to Jews in the first century in Jerusalem who had a knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures. They may have only known the Hebrew scriptures in 
Aramaic quotation or Hebrewized Aramaic, but they had the idea of the original Torah. Some of them would have also obviously had the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. The first word here that we read, every transgression, quite a thing. That is parabasis, parabasis in Greek. It means in Greek violating, violating. Now, it's simply translating a Hebrew concept. The Hebrew term that it's translating is pesha, pesha, going too far, going too far, transgressing the parameters set by God. Going too far. Just say, hypothetically, a young Christian couple are engaged and they're going to be joined in holy wedlock. And obviously, they're young and they're engaged and they're looking forward to being married and they're holding hands and they're kissing and things like this. But there is a border, there's a parameter. Until you've made the vow to God, until you have committed to holy matrimony, you don't cross that border in terms of sexual contact. This far, no further. The romance is there, the attraction is there, the affections are there, but this far, no further. You don't go through this gate until you have made the vow to God. No one says that such a couple who's attracted and engaged will not have affections, natural affections. But you don't consummate the relationship until you're married. If you do, it is pesha. It is parabasis. You've gone too far. You've gone too far. Now, the other term, the other term is really interesting. Para koe, para koe. We translate it disobedience, but para koe. It means amiss, or it means inattention. This translates the Hebrew word chet, chet. So in Hebrew, you have Chet and Pesha. Chet and Pesha in the Hebrew language. Okay. Pesha is parabasis in Greek. Chet is parakoe. Chet is not going far enough. Chet has to do with sins of omission. It literally means missing the mark or missing the target. It's when we sin by failing to do things we should. Once someone begins to sin by failing to do what they should, prayer, fellowship, evangelism, scripture. Once we sin by failing to do what we should, and if we ignore those things, it's sin. Let's go back for a moment to evangelism. Unsaved people die. I grew up next door as a little kid to people who were Baptists. They were known as nice people, moral people, 
and they went to a church that I later discovered was evangelical. But there was no evangelism. And the kids went off, one of the kids at least, went, went off into the world terribly. It's just a religion. Uh, I will require their blood of your hands. We read this in Acts and we read it in Ezekiel. Now it has specifically to do, of course, with not giving the gospel to Jews, but it's a general principle. You knew this person, you worked with them, you were offended, you knew this person 20 years, and you never told them the gospel or gave them a tract or anything. You had the message. You had the way of salvation. Now, if they rejected it, that's down to them. But if you having that message didn't give it to them, the Lord is going to hold us accountable for not having given the message of salvation to unsaved people. Now, it has to be Holy Spirit-led and directed. Remember, in the book of Acts, we're told Paul's mission team, the Holy Spirit forbade them to preach there. There are times God says to shut up or, or not to evangelize in a certain place. There are times and places that can happen. And we're told, cast not your pearls before swine. People who are just going to mock the gospel, who are going to mock our beliefs, we shouldn't witness to them. We can only pray for them, but we shouldn't witness to them. We should not cast our pearls before swine. I saw a news clip yesterday where a Christian was reading the Bible and some homosexual activists ripped the Bible from his hand and tore the pages out of the Bible and threw the pages on the ground, and one of them began eating the pages. These, in the eyes of God, are swine. They're humans who behave in the character of pigs. We shouldn't try to witness to such people. People who are going to mock, not just reject, but mock, ridicule what we believe, don't cast your pearls before those pigs. I'm not saying we're called to witness to every person, but the Holy Spirit will show us. We should try to witness to as many people as we can. The Lord will put people in our way. Don't hold back the sword from blood. It is a sin if we do not witness. Do it as the Holy Spirit guides us, but it's a sin if we don't do it. It is a sin if we neglect our prayer life. Can you imagine not talking, shunning your husband or your wife or your children or your parents? You shun them. Well, when we don't pray, we shun God. And if we don't read his word, we ignore him. By not praying, we shun God. We shun our maker. We shun our savior. We shun him. By not reading his word, we ignore him when he speaks to us. There's a sense. And then forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another. Especially as you see the day approaching, we will deal with that when we get to chapter 10. That verse is from Hebrews chapter 10. We are told in Proverbs 18, he who remains alone lacks sense. He quarrels against all wisdom. Now I understand and I appreciate that there are sincere Christians who cannot find a biblically-based church near where they live. So they try to have home groups or meet online or whatever they try to do. They still try to find fellowship as best they can. And I know that there's Christians, I've been to countries where it's dangerous. I've been to Saudi Arabia and places like this. I understand those things. God understands those things. But those who have an option, if you meet in a home with three other people, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in there in their midst. When you see Christians who optionally, optionally, not through circumstances beyond their control, 
but who opt to be out of fellowship with other believers, they are really out of fellowship with the Lord himself. If you're in fellowship with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is automatically going to connect you, and you're going to want to connect with other people who know and believe what you do. If you don't, it's a sin. You've drifted. Not from the church. That is a mere ramification. You've drifted from the Lord himself. These things are sin. They are sins of parakoi, chet, missing the mark, missing the target, sins of omission, doing things we're told to do is faithfulness. Not doing things we're told to do is parakoi. We're being inattentive to the instructions God gave us. Now understand something. When God gave the Torah to Israel, to the law to the Jews, he said, keep my laws that it may be well with you. God loves us. He likes us. Well, he loves us and he wants us. But he doesn't need us. He does not need any of us. We need him, but he sure doesn't need us. If he needed us, he wouldn't be God. Desires us because of his love? Yes. Need us? Absolutely not. We know that. God does not need us to keep his laws for his sake. He doesn't need anything from anybody. God wants us to keep his commandments for our sake, that it may be well with you, that you will not come under the judgment of the unsaved. Or as he told Israel, do not practice the abominations of these nations, etc. When God gives these commands, it's for our sake. A red light or a stop sign is there to protect us from going into an intersection and getting slammed. God makes these laws to protect us. If we don't pay attention, if we're inattentive, it's paracoid. If you go through the red light, it's parabasis. Once you begin practicing parakoe, chet, missing the mark, you will eventually, and probably not in a very long time, it won't take too long, most of the time, go into parabasis. You will go into pesha. When we fail to do the things we should, it is inevitable that we will do things we shouldn't. With the sins of omission, we drift. With the sins of commission, we violate. That's what he's saying. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, God does not change his word. You have people. You even have people who claim to be saved. Certain theologians and pastors and preachers and authors. Steve Chalk in Great Britain will be one of them, but there are others. They are saying what the Bible said about same-sex relationships, that was for then and for that culture. It's not for us now. It's people who say things like that. When people do that, what they are saying is the following. The church wrote the Bible, and the church can rewrite it. They make the scriptures the word of the church, not the word of the Lord. Well, first of all, two-thirds of the scripture were given 
to and through Israel, not the church. But that's preliminary. I recall the satanically animated deceiver who wrote the book on the emerging church, Brian McLaren. And McLaren said, the church should declare a five-year moratorium on discussing same-sex marriage and homosexuality and lesbianism. We should declare a five-year moratorium on even discussing it. And he said, if we have not reached a consensus at the end of five years, we should have another five-year moratorium. Then the church should decide about same-sex marriage. Well, he didn't even get through the first five years, let alone the second. He performed, officiated at a same-sex marriage for his son and his son's husband. McLaren, of course, had no theological background in Greek or Hebrew or doctrinal theology. He was an English teacher. That doesn't bother me. But he couldn't even read the Bible in English, let alone Greek and Hebrew. He couldn't even read Romans 1 in English. This is a wicked, wicked man, a servant of Satan. He's of the devil. Yet many people got caught up in the so-called emergent church and his lies. We should declare a moratorium on speaking about it. Just ignore it. Omit it. Sin of omission. Then he performs the same-sex marriage for his son to his son's husband becomes a sin of commission. Whether he was ever born again, we can debate. I don't know. But I know he's not... <laughs> not one of us. He's not... <laughs> He does not belong to the Lord Jesus now. This book was very popular. No. He basically said the Bible is the word of the church. It's the word of man, not the word of God. Roman Catholicism has had a similar view to Scripture that the papacy has authority over what it actually says and can issue decrees that contradict it. For instance, taking out the second commandment, Jesus and Moses both warned of the hell-damning ramifications of taking something out of Scripture, such as, you shall not make a graven image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Well, they just take that out, and they have the statue of Mary with roses on front of it, and they put a golden crown on it, and they sing Ave Maria. This is open idolatry. It is open necromancy. They think the scripture is the word of the church, their church, not the word of God. No, it is inalterable. It was given by angelic means but it is inalterable. You cannot change it. It's not going to change. Not one jot or tittle of even the Torah was going to change, Jesus said. It could be fulfilled, but it couldn't change. Every transgression, everyone. Look what it says. How shall we escape if it's inalterable? And every transgression, that is of every parabasis and every paracole, everyone is going to be brought into judgment and receive a just penalty. Everyone 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What a statement. Uh, it means to flee to safety. To flee to safety. That word is used various places in the New Testament, but the concept is throughout Scripture. To flee to safety. How do we understand it? Well, let's look at some examples. Lot and his family, when Sodom and Gomorrah were being destroyed, were told to flee to Ramat Zahar, the little place of, of safety, a place of safety. Isaiah tells us there will be a flight by believing Jews after the rapture and resurrection to Petra, a place of safety. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he told the believers, literally, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee to the mountains. And that happened under his cousin Simeon, who became the senior pastor in Jerusalem after James was martyred. Simeon led the believers out, and they went to a place called Pila, Pila, in the Jordan Valley, and they were rescued before Titus finally destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, all of these events are types of the rapture, the rescue. Twice the New Testament uses what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah as pictures of what is going to precipitate the rapture and, re and, res and rescue. Homosexuality is going to become more and more militant and aggressive. I would point you to our teaching tape, our recorded teaching, not even a minyan. Now, it just so happens I shall have to visit a fellowship at a place called Arad in Israel, and I'll be going right by Ramat uh, Zahar, where Lot escaped to. We don't know where Sodom and Gomorrah were exactly for sure. The archaeologists debate, but we know where Zohar was. And I'm going to stand on it and stop the car for a minute, hopefully, and take, take Marco Quintana out and show him where it is. And I have a meeting with uh, Dr. Ray Pritz, who was an elder of a fellowship in Modi'in, where the Maccabees came from. And he's, he's a scholar, he's an academic. And his doctoral thesis was about what happened to the first century Christians in 70 AD who escaped. I have a copy of it. I met him many years ago, but I haven't seen him in many years. And I'm looking forward to touch base with him again. Well, so happens. It's just coincidental. I'll be in Israel at the same time. We're up to Hebrews chapter 2. What happened in 70 AD that Dr. Prince did his thesis on with, with Simeon, the cousin of Jesus, and the escape of the believers? What happened with Lot and his family? They fled to a place of safety. Now, this fleeing of these literal historical events prefigure, foreshadow the rapture of the church. We shall indeed meet the Lord. Well, let's go. If we ignore these things, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Notice it's speaking on two levels. One, it is speaking on an eschatological level. If we ignore what is being taught in verses 1 and 2, the dangers of drifting, the dangers of the sins of omission, leading us into commission, if we ignore these things, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we are not not just believing the gospel, but with the empowerment of the Lord seeking to live the gospel, we are 
neglecting our salvation. We're in the world, but not of it, but we've been saved out of it. If we live as unsaved people, if we live immorally, if we abuse alcohol or have romantic and sexual relations outside of marriage, if we do things like this, we're neglecting our salvation. Such people will not be rescued. They will not be able to flee. They will be like the foolish virgins. But I digress. But let's look at what it says. If we ignore these things, how are we going to escape from the judgment that's coming on this world? Now that is <clears throat> something specifically true <coughs> for the close of the age. But it is a general truth. How shall we escape? Escape what? God is going to bring every transgression into judgment. <coughs> Don't you want to escape from culpability? <coughs> when we stand before the Lord, we're all guilty. Our plea is that Jesus paid for what we did. But if we come to faith in him and continue to live as unsaved people, <coughs> we're not going to escape. This is what Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 tells us. Unless we understand Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we will never understand Hebrews chapter 6 or Hebrews chapter 10. Get the introduction. After it was confirmed to us by those who heard. The reason we know Hebrews is canonical, even though we cannot be 100% sure of its author is we know the early church, the apostolic church, held it as canonical. Look what it says. After it was confirmed by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Well, let's look at this very carefully. This word, abiote, come, is, or the word to confirm, to make firm. Babayo, babayo, a strange word. It means to establish something by making it firm. Think of concrete, of cement that's left to harden. You make it firm. You want to build a foundation. You pour the cement, or you pour the concrete, and you let it harden. That is how something is established in a building. Well, it is using the same analogy. Same analogy. It becomes confirmed. That is babayo. But it is confirmed by those who heard. For something to be canonical, for something to be of doctrinal authority as the word of God included in the New Testament, it has to be confirmed by those who knew Jesus and who heard what he taught. It had to be confirmed by those who knew Jesus and the apostles. Those who did not know Jesus and the apostles and did not hear him and hear them are not qualified to say if something is canonical or not. This is one of the reasons 
there can be no further scripture after the book of Revelation. No further scripture. People have tried to add to it. And that is a horrible, horrible rebellion against the Lord. Their name will be disincluded from the book of life if you do that. But they've done it. No, in order for a book, a text to be canonical, it had to be confirmed by those who heard the teaching from Jesus and the apostles. And since there hasn't been anybody who got their doctrine directly from the apostles, who got it from Jesus since the end of the first century, therefore, there can be no new doctrinal revelation. Be careful of anybody who invents new doctrine. There may be a clearer understanding of doctrines already in Scripture. The Holy Spirit illuminates what's already in Scripture to give us a broader and deeper and clearer understanding of what's in there, particularly with reference to prophecy and the return of Christ. There is that, but there's no new doctrine. The only way to have something as canon, as doctrine, it had to be confirmed by those who heard it directly, not secondhand. They had to get it from Jesus and the apostles. You had to get it from Jesus or from people who got it directly from Jesus. Nothing third hand, nothing somebody's opinion. It's the word of God. It is not the word of man. Man has no authority to alter or change it, to add to it or take away from it, or to determine if it's canonical or not. The only way to determinatively pronounce something as canonical is the apostles said it was. That's what it's telling us. Well, that's quite a lot. Remember a number of the things we will see in the future chapters as we go through Hebrews are rooted in this preface of chapters 1 and 2. So we will leave it there at verse 4. But we'll add this. Notice, testifying with them by signs, wonders, and miracles, by gifts of the Spirit, according to his own will. Nesim v'niflaot, signs and wonders, miracles, gifts of the Spirit. The apostles did these signs. Now, we cannot say only the 12 apostles did these signs. That's nonsense. Stephen did these signs. Others did these signs. Paul says so. But these signs only serve to co-confirm or to confirm the word of God and the gospel. Signs and wonders, miracles, gifts of the spirit are not the basis of it signs follow. Let's look again at verse 4. God testifies by signs and wonders and miracles and by gifts according to his own will. First of all, these demonstrations of power are there, but they were particularly exhibited in the ministry of the apostles who heard the doctrine directly from Jesus and who were directly inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it. It is interesting that the Quran never attributes a single miracle to Muhammad of him doing the miracles. 
they say supernatural things happened around him, but he himself never did a miracle. It's interesting. Never. Well, Moses did miracles. <laughs> Elijah did miracles. Jesus did miracles. The apostles did miracles. They all did miracles. How can other religions make these claims? Let's look as another example of Buddhism. The story I always tell. It doesn't matter if it's a, what if, if it's if it's a Theravada Buddhist or a Zen Buddhist. There are different kinds of Buddhism. Buddhism is not a single religion. It is at least three or four religious philosophies, and they're quite different than each other. Tibetan Buddhism, Islamism, it's reincarnational. Zen Buddhism is, is basically mystical and philosophical. Theravada is mystical Buddhism, and it's polytheistic. Other Buddhists don't believe in a god. It's there's no such single religion as Buddhism. But they all claim to follow Gautama, the Buddha. And the legends of Buddhism teach, because he didn't write anything in his own day. There was nothing written a hundred or even two hundred years after him, before anything was written about him and attributed to him. Unlike the, the New Testament, it was the actual witnesses of Jesus who wrote the Gospels. In Buddhism, you're waiting to hundreds of years later. Well, what happens? A woman comes to the Buddha and says, Oh, Master Buddha, my son, my only son has died and I'm grieved. And I cannot cope with the grief. What shall I do? And the Buddha tells her, you must plant an acorn, my darling. But you must find an acorn in a house in which no one has ever died. And she traveled the length and breadth of India for many years and returned to the Buddha and said, Oh, Buddha, I've been unable to find a house where no one never died. And he said, You've learned a great lesson, my daughter. <laughs> According to Buddhism, a Buddha had no solution for the power of death. No miraculous power was ascribed or attributed to Buddha initially. Jesus claimed to defeat death. And he said he will destroy death. The last enemy to be abolished will be death. And Jesus did do miracles and his apostles did miracles. When you compare the Gospels, and the New Testament with other religions. You see what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4 is talking about. What miracles did Joseph Smith do? What miracles? God also testifying with them. God testified. And these miracles were by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The writer of Hebrews states something that Paul also states in Corinthians. The Lord gives charismatic gifts according to his own will. It is the Lord who empowers and dictates and directs charismatic manifestation, not people. People cannot practice charismatic gifts of their own initiative. The Holy Spirit must be directing and empowering them to do it in any given situation. One of the examples we always give, and I'll conclude with this, is Luke chapter 5.
Verse 17. And the dunamis, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. The only one who could have done miracles on his own initiative was Jesus, and he never did. For our sake, he subjected himself to the limitations we have, and he never did a miracle in his own power or his own authority. <clears throat> he only did what he saw his father doing. Jesus was the one person who could have done a miracle of his own initiative, but he didn't. You've got people running around saying that they're going to do this and do that, and I prophesy in the name of Jesus, and I command in the name of Jesus. They're just running around with a formula incantation. The power had to be present for Jesus to heal, or he wouldn't have done it. You can pray for a sick person, but if you're going to command somebody to get out of a deathbed, or command a terminal disease to disappear. The Holy Spirit has to be empowering you and telling you to do it in that specific situation. Pray for the sick, yes. Command in the name of Jesus a disease to disappear. The Holy Spirit has to be empowering and telling you to do it in that given situation. You can't pray in tongues at will. The Holy Spirit must come upon you and give you that tongue, or it's gibberish. You can't prophesy at will. The Holy Spirit has to come on you and give you that prophecy. Otherwise, it is clairvoyance. Notice these gifts of the Spirit, these miracles and signs and wonders, confirm the gospel they confirm the gospel they don't replace it when you see people coming out god has shown me and they proclaim some silly doctrine that's not scriptural no gifts of the spirit are not designed to, to make doctrine they are designed to confirm doctrine they're not a basis for making it. Only God can make it. The gifts of the Spirit can only confirm what God has made. And only God can enable and empower that gift of the Spirit to be manifested and practiced. Otherwise, you have a counterfeit or a nothing. That's what it's saying. <clears throat> 